a little background on Benetech's human rights program. Um, we, uh, Benetech as an organization develops software for social good. Um, at the human rights program, um, Benetech hosted a software, a human rights documentation um, and data management software called uh, MARTIS for several years, um, over a decade. And some of you might be familiar with that tool. Um, that tool was sunset in uh, 2018. Um, just because the pace of technological development was so rapid and um, it, there was a huge need to just completely revamp and update the code. Um, so uh, when Benetech Sunset Martis, the question was, what are the gaps in the human rights landscape that we could be filling? What currently isn't being done or not being done effectively. Um, and so uh, there was a big challenge around um, big uh, data analysis. And um, the challenge was that more and more people had smartphones, digital cameras on the ground um, in conflict, and they were filming what was happening around them, putting it up on YouTube, on social media platforms, and human rights organizations were down downloading this content um, and really struggling to make sense out of everything because uh, it was so huge. I mean, at one point in Syria, there was more um, hours of video on YouTube of the conflict than there was actual hours of the conflict. Um, and so that it just became um, really burdensome. The time and high cost of manual and analysis was really high. There was a lot of duplicate and related video, but because of missing or inaccurate metadata, folks weren't able to um, uh, to match that or, or, or make sense out of what was related. Um, there was the high cost of archiving and storage. Um, and then of course, um, when you're looking at um, having a team review all of these videos, um, you're putting them at risk of secondary trauma. So um, of course these, uh, these challenges are huge, but then in 2016, the United Nations created the IIIM, the Independent International Impartial Mechanism for Syria to investigate war crimes. And they were tasked with collecting everything from all the groups. So their challenges were multiplied because they had hundreds of data sources. As I said, nowhere is the problem more critical than Syria, but their applications for human rights and justice are numerous. So there are other conflict situations where activists and media groups are filming um, what's happening around them and posting them online, um, including in Yemen. Um, there's crackdowns on protests where protesters bring their smartphones or their digital cameras with them to the protest film what's happening around them. I think, you know, I'm, I'm in the United States here in, D in Washington, D.C. Lots of protests over the summer here and everyone I saw was carrying their phones and, and filming and, and posting online. Um, international tribunals and truth commissions are, are tasked with, um, you know, bringing justice uh, for victims, um, finding truth in conflict um, and repressive environments. Um, and so they're dealing with these same problems. And then of course, investigative journalists have kind of a similar mandate in terms of um, investigating the truth and, and shedding light on, on what's happening. Um, so really what we're focused on here when it comes to artificial intelligence, and I'll explain exactly what we're doing, but I want to set the scene, is that we want to support investigators seeking justice and truth for individuals impacted by conflict and human rights abuses. Um, make, we want to help make their jobs um, a little bit easier, a little bit more efficient, and really maximize the power of kind of the, the digital avalanche of, 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 of data and, and, and videos and images in particular. Um, so what are the benefits of some of the tools we created? Really, we were talking with the Syrian human rights organizations and the UN mechanism to develop this idea. We didn't just develop it in a vacuum. Um, and so we came up with these um, kind of needs um, in collaboration with them and then set out to build a, something that could securely help them do what they need to do. Because of course, when you're working in human rights, the underlying issues are always related to security and confidentiality of your documentation. So um, we created a system where um, each video is processed and um, a unique fingerprint is generated based on the actual content of that video. Um, and so uh, those fingerprints are able to be matched according to how similar they are in content. So you might have two videos of a cluster munition attack 
and one video has is low quality and one video is high quality, normal hashing would not be able to, uh, to identify those as duplicate, even though they're depicting the exact same scene. Um, so through machine learning and computer vision, we're able to match those videos, um, create a unique fingerprint, match those videos. Um, what makes that really cool is that the fingerprints are a, a mechanism by which the fingerprints cannot be reverse engineered. And so when two organizations want to collaborate on an investigation, they can share their fingerprints with each other, identify matches, and work more securely. Right now, data sharing is extremely tricky and not often done. Um, the, the tools can also detect the number of scenes in a video and fingerprint each scene individually so that you can get more accurate matches, especially in content that's highly edited. Um, there's basic object recognition and reverse frame search. Um, there's uh, extraction of key metadata and ability to filter out corrupt videos, videos that you know are completely black screens, not really valuable to investigation. So really what we're doing here is trying to um, narrow down the funnel. So here you have so much information and you're just trying to narrow things down to get to you know, that needle in the haystack. Um, and so we're also creating not just the kind of underlying algorithms and, and code, but also a platform where you can visualize and interact with results and securely work across data silos to identify com common files and facilitate collaboration. Um, so really what we're doing is enabling justice mechanisms to make targeted requests for data work more efficiently, work more effectively with their partners. Um, so just to give you kind of a snapshot of what this looks like on the platform, um, these are these are screenshots. Um, uh, so you can see here that um, you can view the video if you're if you're running locally and you're connected to your own data. You can you can um, play the video. You can identify easily the number of um, uh, scenes in each video. You can get the basic video information that's been extracted, including the objects that were extracted. Um, in the video. And, um, and then if, if any XF data exists, um, you would be able to see that as well. Um, you would then be able to go and compare and um, see all the videos that are uh, matched to that video according to the algorithm, and then be able to view them side by side and kind of um, toggle between, uh, between videos um, that have been matched. Um, and then kind of getting a bigger picture, you would also be able to see, you know, what are the clusters of data that are related to each other. And then you could compare in the fingerprint index with other organizations that um, might have similar content to yours, because you might want to reach out to them and ask, okay, I have this video, you seem to have something that's somewhat related, maybe it's give, maybe it gives us more information than we would otherwise have. So um, working, working more securely together. Um, so I guess I'll go through some of the challenges um, related to developing these types of tools. And then I'll, I kind of want to just open up for discussion and hear from you all. I mean, of course, questions if you have them, um, but also your experiences um, working with artificial intelligence, kind of what brought you to this session in particular. Um, and, and hearing more about, um, you know, what you know, lessons learned you might have uh, experienced that maybe I, I, I haven't raised in this discussion. Um, so one of the main challenges and really what I think is probably a challenge for all sorts of tech, but is particularly difficult with artificial intelligence because there's a lot of misunderstanding and um, not a lot of uh, awareness or knowledge of, of sort of the risks and the benefits and what's actually possible. So capacity becomes a big um, issue here. I think um, internal, um, when you're working with human rights organizations, few of them would have tech expertise, or even if they have tech expertise, it might be minimal and not so much related to understanding of these kind of emerging technologies. Um, so being able um, to provide some sort of support is really essential um, to, to 
being able to develop these tools in collaboration with human rights organizations. It's not just about developing the algorithm and having a really great algorithm. It's also about providing the training and capacity building support. Um, there's also the hardware and resources. Um, uh, even if the organizations have, you know, um, use the cloud or they have a local machine, it might not be a GPU enabled um, or a, a, a machine that they can, you know, run, you know, intensive algorithms on. Uh, so making sure that, you know, you're able to provide that support and provide that at either minimal to no cost to them. Um, and then, of, like, these tools take a long time to de develop. There's a lot, it's a like iterative process, a lot of back and forth, a lot of staff time involved in providing um, checks that yes, this is um, accurate. This is um, matching the videos that we thought it would match. Um, uh, providing, of course, the normal uh, tech feedback around UX, UI. Um, so that, all is can be intensive um, for low resource organizations that maybe are really stretched thin with staff. And so taking that into consideration and building in a lot of lead time in terms of developing things because it's always going to take longer than you expect and you have to be really patient and flexible with the organizations you're working with. Um, and then uh, uh, coordination, I think, is uh, in terms of capacity, I think this is more for the technologists. Um, there's a lot of like groups working on different AI tools for human rights or for other uses. And um, because it's so labor intensive to develop these things, I really think that it would behoove us to coordinate more and not duplicate efforts because it's really like, it's always a, a waste in the tech world, but it's even more of a waste in this space. Um, so uh, uh, really um, talking to others who are kind of developing things that are similar to you and making sure that you're not um, kind of duplicating or at least trying to build off of each other. Um, in terms of uh, another challenge, um, there's the training data sets, right? So yeah, there's large open source training data sets that Google's published and others have published, but um, they're cat sounds, flowers, birds, um, they're not human rights specific. And so for human rights specific sounds or objects such as cluster munition remnants or um, you know, cluster munition explosions, cannon fire, um, these things, it's harder to find um, uh, the types of data, label data sets that are relevant to the um, to the algorithms that human rights organizations are interested in um, in developing and using. So um, that can be a huge challenge. And then on top of that, um, when you're talking about you know developing these training data sets, organizations, as I said, are very for good reason, protective of their data, um, a lot of security confidentiality issues involved. And so sharing that and creating something that would be either public or available to other human rights groups, um, it's not gonna be an easy sell. And, um, and so, you know, something that we're looking into right now is developing some training data sets um, and creating some sort of um, data governance structure around that about who could access it, how can they access, who decides who accesses. Um, so that's kind of one of a big one of the big challenges around developing these things is just getting access to the data, um, not just to the data because I could go and, and go to YouTube and scrape everything, but getting access to the labeled data sets, the stuff that's actually been reviewed and, and tagged and labeled. Um, and then there's the time and, as I said, the iterative process to, to label and train that, um, again, can, can be overwhelming and time consuming for, for the organizations. And then um, finally, the last, I mean, this isn't the, I could, I could probably speak for hours about all the challenges related to doing this work, but um, the, the third big bucket that I'll talk about is um, kind of the effectiveness of AI. Um, I've seen um, organizations, um, academic institutions, um, uh, companies developing AI for, for nonprofit organizations, and they give them the algorithm and they say, have at it. Um, uh, but really the, the speed isn't there. So um, 
developing the algorithm for us as Benetech was actually the easiest part of this whole process. Um, what was difficult was cutting down on the speed, cutting down on the speed so that we could get it down to two to three seconds per video. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, while it might seem that 20 seconds per video or 10 seconds per video would be faster than a human reviewer. Um, that's still when you're talking about organizations that have collected a million, two million. We were working with one organization that has collected three million videos from Syria. Um, you know, that could take years if you're not cutting down on that time. Um, so really focusing on, on the speed and the accuracy to make sure that, you know, whatever you're developing is actually going to be useful um, for them. And then, um, and then the efficiency myth. I keep harping on this, but this stuff takes time. And so if you're working with an organization that has 5,000, 10,000 videos, um, the cost and time of developing something specific for them, you might just say, well, how can we spend this money? Can we get staff? Can we get volunteers? Can we get um, folks to be kind of reviewing this and providing them with psychosocial support and the types of support that they need to do it? And would that actually be faster than actually developing something? Um, uh, and, uh, and so really like thinking about who are you working with? How many organizations will benefit from this? Um, what is the scale of the data they have? Um, and uh, yeah, the utility beyond just your individual project. Um, and then uh, the data management workflow. So like, how does this all fit into the whole um, system? Not just, um, uh, you know, you might, I think it, it sounds really nice to generate more data. Um, and you're like, well, if we get more data about the data, we'll be able to use this data better. But if you're not if you don't have a good management system for your existing data, where are you gonna put the data that's being generated through AI? How are you managing that? How is that all fitting together? Um, uh, I think you know you might develop something and then it's not actually gonna be used because that the, the outputs from that don't have anywhere to go um, and they don't have any practical way to use it um, beyond like a flashy chart. So um, that's kind of uh, something else that I think um, should, should receive more attention. So yeah, um, just a summary of the lessons learned, training and capacity building, if, you're, if possible funding for par to partners for co-design and the time spent training algorithms, um, the processing speed and simplicity of running the code, really important. Um, uh, in, you know, just launching something, um, it's not, it's not going to be, uh, you know, um, as simple as other types of tech where you might just have an app that you can, you can download and, and run on your, on your smartphone. Um, it's a bit more complicated. And so simplifying it as much as possible so that other groups can um, take advantage of it, even if they don't have um, machine learning expertise on their staff. Um, uh, addressing risks and ethical concerns, um, again, like working with a, like work, just like any other tech, like working on a risk matrices, risk, risk, risk matrices, um, addressing ethical concerns around AI. Um, uh, are you creating more harms than, than benefits by, by developing something and putting out there open source? Um, and then explainability, being able to understand what is this thing doing? Is it just a black box? Can you explain it to human rights groups so that they can feel confident using it? Um, again, the UX, UI investments and feedback on visualization and design. You're generating all of this data. How can you make sense out of it? How can you interact with it? And then again, like fitting in what you're doing into the existing processes of a human rights organization. So from ingestion management to the analysis workflow, how, how does this work in practice? <laughs>